ہمارے Elijah J. Magnair, a veteran war zone correspondent and political analyst covering the Middle East, in his opinion article has opened up the whole of Netanyahu's war narrative. He pointed out that Hezbollah, with just one day missile and rocket attack on Israel, has established its deterrence against one of the most formidable armies in the world, the Israel Defense Forces. By employing inexpensive weapons, Hezbollah has regained the upper hand against Israel. Hezbollah demonstrated its military capability by targeting 100 kilometers inside Israeli territory and it's a significant shift in the power dynamics. Elijah J. Magnia further pointed out that the U.S. has sent a message to Lebanon that Israel considers the situation de-escalated, suggesting that the Israeli leadership recognizes Hezbollah's deterrence. Israel's reluctance to escalate further suggests that Hezbollah's retaliation has restored the rules of engagement that Israel has violated by attacking Lebanon. Netanyahu's dubious claims of preemptive strikes that destroyed Hezbollah's missile launching positions and prevented an attack on Tel Aviv has been proven wrong. Whereas, on the other hand, after Hezbollah's attack, Israeli war cabinet issued censorship orders prohibiting the reporting of any damage resulting from strikes as evidence of targeted strikes were available on all social media platforms and Hezbollah also presented them to the world media. Whereas if we look into Western media, Israeli propaganda machinery depicts entirely a different image of the Hezbollah attack and Zionist states so-called preemptive strikes. The New York Times reported that Israel strikes Hezbollah in Lebanon and says it thwarted major attack and destroyed rocket launchers. The Telegraph covers it with its lead, Israel's preemptive strikes, not end of story, Netanyahu warns. The Independent covers it under lead, Netanyahu warns this is not the end, after Israel and Hezbollah exchange heavy fire in major escalation. The Washington Post reported that how Israel and Hezbollah stepped back from the brink of an all-out war. Western media outlets, as advised by Zionist war cabinet, remained silent and avoids to elaborate how severely Hezbollah has hurted Israel. But it is clear from the headlines that Israel stepped back from further escalation. It's only under fear and Elijah J. Magnia is right in his opinion that Israel recognizes Hezbollah's deterrence. American and Israeli strategic experts believe that Zionist state could not handle war fronts without the help of the USA. And the assumption that Tel Aviv can handle battlefield with the help of American weapons and training also proved wrong. Israel need full support to deal Hezbollah as well as Iran. David Menashe, professor at Tel Aviv University and founding director of its Alliance Center for Iranian Studies in a television interview briefed that we cannot go to a war with Iran without the USA. There is no other military option. American professor John Mearsheimer pointed out that in the recent years, Israel claimed that it could defend itself, it need to buy weapons from the United States. But where it comes to fighting against its adversaries, it could do it alone. It is a sovereign state, but it's very clear that Israel need the United States and they need the United States in a big way. But the real problem is if you are Israel, you don't want to be in a situation where you're dependent on any other country in the crunch. And this includes the United States. And for a long time, it was the central plan of Israeli security policy. Another expert, former American Marine and intelligence officer, Scott Ritter, in a six months old interview, completely analyzed the Middle East situation by saying that Israel cannot defeat Hamas militarily. Hamas still as military force is capable of doing October the 7th type attack. 
and politically stronger than ever before. No one can keep Iran down. Iran is up. Excess of resistance is up. Hezbollah is elevated. Hamas and Houthis are elevated. Militias in Iraq and Syria are stronger than ever before and standing up against the United States and winning. There is no deterrence. Mr. Ritter also shed light on if the United States attacks Iran, which will happen, we, he said during the era of President Donald Trump, when he wanted to retaliate after the global hawk was shot down, the president ordered to bomb Iran. The Pentagon told you cannot. Here are the targets, but if you do this, it begins with a cycle of violence that will lead to a general war. And we are not ready for this war. It will take months, maybe years, to muster the force necessary. But Iran will destroy everything we have in the region. And even once we get our forces, there is no guarantee that we are going to win. It stopped Trump to bomb Iran, and he believes that it's preventing Joe Biden from escalating as well. This is the reality that Middle East has changed and all these nations profiting from the old system surviving under the US umbrella and struggling to find a new system and they are weak in terms of their imaginations. Instead of accepting the reality, they were trying to go back. That's not going to work. They have to accept the reality. Hamas is a reality and so is Hezbollah. Middle East has changed. The excess of resistance under Iran has elevated. Hezbollah has proved its military might and American experts believe that it is not easy to win against Iranian resistance and future conflict will be more destructive for Israel than previous engagements since 1967. That is our topic of discussion today and to discuss this I'm joined by our panel of experts today. Joining us in Islamabad studio is Dr. Omar Riaz Abbasi. Uh, he's a PhD scholar, senior analyst, author of many national and international publications. Thank you very much, Dr. Abbasi, for joining us. Joining us from Lahore uh, is Mr. Ali Hamza. He's a columnist and a broadcast journalist. Thank you very much, uh, Ali Hamza, for joining us. And uh, we are joined by Ms. Shazia Chima. She's joining us from Prague, Czech Republic. Uh, she writes on these subjects. She's a foreign ex affairs expert, columnist. Thank you very much, Ms. Chima, for joining us. And uh, if I may start with you, ladies first. So first and foremost, uh, Hezbollah's recent attacks, when we look at them, they have proven one thing at least, that, that, that myth which Israel always had, it has broken that myth that the Israeli uh, army is the most formidable or nobody can penetrate its uh, defense or security system. So how, uh, in your opinion, how does this whole thing shift the balance of power in the region your point is uh, correct i mean in in in, in a way that this uh, idea of uh, israeli deterrence cannot be penetrated it has been demolished by iran uh, hmm. if we remember that the iranian attack Absolutely. it was also a successful yeah. attack but right now we are having a very uh, in a way, bizarre uh, narrative war. Mm. So we are getting a Western Anglo-Saxon narrative, which is predominant, uh, which is overwhelmingly everywhere. And then there is uh, the actual narrative, the ground reality. So um, we, we are having two perspectives. So far, this Hezbollah attack is concerned. We have like a clear division in, in the Western media that, that the, the attack was not successful yeah. and the three two, 230 missiles, which were not even the latest missile, um, uh, and, um, Hezbollah claimed that they used uh, the, Absolutely. Uh, the missile of Second World War, um, the age of the Second World War. So they were, they were old missiles and, and even then they penetrated the Iron Dome and mm. they hit the targeted and Israel um, right after the attack uh, announced the clean and clear um, 
blackout media blackout so they they, they we, we don't have evidence hmm. um, all the footage and the media reports which are being circulated on western media are old or either faked or crafted or um, doctored but but they have this narrative so we don't know who is lying and who is um, or who is telling the truth and who is um, giving us the clear picture because we don't have the clear picture the only thing we can do is to analyze by ourselves that israel has different accounts with iran and it has opened a different account with hezbollah and mm. hezbollah iran and axis of resistance are being proved the only adult in the room so israel want the escalation war escalation a broader um, greater war for its own survival for its own political and state survival and uh, is hezbollah and iran they are playing this uh, war of nerve and mm. and they are taking their time they are not in hurry and uh, and and we have reports that netanyahu spent like couple of weeks in a bunker because yeah. there is also yeah. report that iran may not attack like a symmetrical attack um, on israel it may be asymmetrical so it could be tit for tat it could be taking a life uh, in, uh, in answer to to a life so so it's it's all war uh, on nerve i have to talk uh, about this war of nerve and narratives which you mentioned but before that dr abasi let's talk more about this particular attack in fact hezbollah uh, in fact um, you know acted independently so what does this tell us see when you look at this uh, attack it reveals this very crucial point that you don't need to have that coordination with the excess of resistance which is obviously an alliance between hezbollah and iran and other regional forces how is this a strategy successful thank you sadia <clears throat> for inviting me on a such a important and sensitive issue uh, let me go through the prophetic uh, saying about this uh, relevant to your question prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this is narrated by hazrat abu darda radiyallahu ta'ala anhu in musnad ahmad prophet said there will be continuously remain group from my ummah uh, upon the truth uh, whom will overwhelm their enemy their opposition will not be able to harm them except for some difficulties mm. and then companion were sitting around the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they asked who are they people where they live prophet said they will be from jerusalem hmm. and surroundings so this is uh, you know anticipation of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam 14 centuries ago about those groups who are fighting for their right of self determination they are uh, fighting for their lives fighting for their homeland let me look at the, uh, another view of humanitarian ground hmm. palestine is belong to palestinian people whether they are jews they are christians they are palestinian people this is humanitarian issue they are legitimate to live there they are mawatin in arabic a world is called they are mawatin. local and settlers hmm. Hmm. they were deprived from their houses hmm. so israel according to qaida al muhammad ali jinnah is illegitimate child of the west so uh, world must ensure that this side of perception is very very durable because hmm. 2.3 million uh, people have been squeezed into 41 km area and this is uh, the largest open air prison in the world mm. the world is going where but the muslims they have been deprived from their life you said hezbollah is you know not consulting with other groups like hamas al qassam brigade i think this is their strategy yeah, yeah, they want to exactly. they want to they involve and indulge israeli mechanism mm, mm. they want to test their nerves Hmm. but they are fighting for their uh, their lives infrastructure has been damaged there is complete blackout more than 40000 people have been killed hmm. innocent people pregnant women have been yeah. killed where the international community this is the slap on on the face of international community when the students from california university from west even in norway for, uh, last week thousands of millions of people they came on the street in the favor of people of palestine hmm. that don't deploy arms to israel so i think israel is the puppet and colony of uh, united states and they want to uh, support and remain in this region and predictions related to the region uh, by prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the end of uh, the world war will be fought here in this land hmm. because this land land of prophets land of sulaiman al-islam daud al-islam 
land of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And why Muslims are, uh, you know, in the favor of uh, people of Palestine? Because Al-Isra Miraj was launched yeah. from Masjid-e-Aqsa. And Masjid-e-Aqsa has great ties with the Muslims in terms of Miraj, in terms of holy place. And Prophet said, uh, a army was uh, will be you know uh, sent to uh, the people of Jerusalem for their help right. from subcontinent mm. Khorasan mm. and they people will be powerful armies their soldiers with power mm. they will be weaponized this is the sign towards the uh, atomic weapons of Pakistan the day will come that Pakistan and uh, the army of Pakistan they will fight for the freedom of, of Jerusalem and Aqsa we must believe in that there are two ideological states one is Pakistan that came into existence after the migration yeah. and state of Medina was also came into existence after the migration of Mecca and the second state was Israel that came into ideology of Zionism. Hmm. Uh, moving on to Mr. Ali Hamza, um, since you are a broadcast journalist yourself and we have seen the level, the topics of debate on not only on Israeli television channels, their networks, I mean one discussion, uh, one clip I saw was uh, uh, is it okay to rape uh, uh, Palestinian prisoners? And whatever our soldiers are doing is according to their book. They are going by the book. This was the level of their discussion, one of the discussions, let me tell you. And when we see at the Western media <coughs> a complete blackout or they would just twist the whole thing, give it another angle which supports the narrative of uh, Israel. So how is that helping? Obviously, there are many factors, the way they fund media outlets, they are their political lobby is really, really strong there. So uh, is, is, it, is that really helping? Uh, thank you for having me, uh, Sadia. Uh, talking about the Western media, that is now an established fact that it, they have a skewed sense of information which only benefits their own interests. Before I get back to this narrative making and Western media, I'll, I'd like to talk about Israel, that's a born baby of British imperialism and Zionism political mm. campaign. And as you were mentioning in your intro, that Hezbollah attack has just disclosed and revealed the inner strength of Israel, that how competent and strong they are to deter such attacks, and that proved that they are not, and they require U.S. support. Now here we have to realize that the existence of AIPAC, that is American yeah. Israel Public Affairs Committee, it has a, a Jewish community or Christian Zionist community that has a strong influence on foreign policy of United States and they try to receive military aid, economic assistance and diplomatic backing. It means that Israel itself was a baby and still a baby. It, it, it did not nurture yet and the reason is it's not natural. Um, now getting back to the Western media. Uh, if you look at the Western media reporting structure, uh, what they do is they portray non-Western countries as um, uh, violent, corrupt, and backward uh, countries. Yes. And if they uh, portray their own Western countries, they portray it, it as a superior country. This skewed portrayal actually fuels xenophobia and Islamophobia and that's what has happened in the West that the, uh, the common people of West have a misunderstood uh, perception of uh, the non-Western countries. So uh, the reason I'm saying that to make it sure that Western media's reporting is very much skewed mm -hmm. and does not have a neutral balanced approach and we have witnessed that during the Ukraine-Russia war. Um, you, you must have seen that to um, defend, not to defend, rather to answer back the Western propaganda, Russian television was a threat to Western media mm -hmm. and they had to stop and ban their accounts and ban their foot footprint in the Western countries. Why? Because they were afraid of, uh, you know, the, the non-Western country having a strong opinion hold. So Western media in shape of news agencies, in shape of movies, in shape of even video games is only propagating Western culture or Western norm with what they believe is a global norm. Considering all the context that I have just mm. said, um, looking at Gaza and Palestinian issue, if we consider the, um, the 
time given to the Palestinian opinion on the Western media, we can see that this appropriate yeah. time division. Yeah. We see 90% of the content on the Western media mm. that supports Israeli opinion and point of view. And only 10%, which is a blend uh, with the other 90%, that talks about Gaza and humanitarian aids. On the other hand, we also see that looking at the Western media, we feel that Israel is the victim and Gaza or Palestinian yeah. are the aggressors. Mm. And this narrative making is the output of Western media. Right, point well taken. We'll uh, go for a short break and when we come back, uh, we'll take uh, questions from our audience for the panel. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Sunu tonight with Saadi Afzal. It's time to include some questions from the audience now. Let's take first question for Ms. Uh, Shazia Chima. Yes, please go on. This is Sarfraz from Namal University in the student of IR. Uh, my question is, uh, we most of the time talk about the Western media and their hypocrisy. We say they are dual standard people and all these things. But at the same time, I see uh, in the Muslim countries, within the Muslim countries, there are thousands and hundreds and thousands of Palestinian people who are being deployed, who are suppressed. Uh, and who are being harmed and damaged. Mm. Why don't we talk about these things? We become very emotional when we talk about m Palestinians and all the, even the world leaders specifically. The Muslim leaders come forward and say all these things, but at the same time, in their own countries, there are Palestinians actually. Right. Palestinian is basically a name of, a, 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 a name of basically being damaged, being suppressed. So, Aren't these okay. Muslim people, aren't, so you see these, double standards aren't, and hypocrisy when aren't we these Muslim leaders or even these hmm. countries hmm. hypocritic themselves? Okay. Why don't they talk about the Yuga Muslims in India? And at the same time, it's also shocking to listen, uh, even from Dr. Saab, that there is uh, a, a, an ideological state. Uh, he's, he was saying that Pakistan yeah. is an ideological state. He was, and at the same time, making some parallels between the state of uh, uh, Medina and the uh, Pakistan, Pakistan state. I mean, there is no parallel at, at all between them, actually. No, the creation. He was talking about the creation because you see it, it was created on the, on the basis of that ideology. Uh, you may say, but at the same time, even the creation, there is no parallel even in the creation. Okay. So I would ask Dr. Saab. Do right. You know, so you, you have basically two questions. Second question is uh, for Dr. Saab. But first question, uh, Ms. Chima, for you. Uh, he's talking about the hypocrisy and double standards when it comes to Muslim-majority countries. Now, first of all, I must say that um, all these young emotions, they are much valued. But better, there is always um, a, a bigger reality in this world. Um, and, and in this situation, reality is twofolded. One is like narrative reality, the narrative aspect of reality. And the other one is political aspect of reality. Uh, even by living in Europe, uh, we all are, are human beings and we see and we feel the empathy for, for the sufferers, for the, for, the, for the victims. That's not like nobody is feeling that. Mm -hmm. Why Muslim countries are not uh, practically doing something, uh, it has two answers. For, so far, narrative is concerned. Narrative is always based on a satellite and media hub system-wise. So if we do not control the social media platform, we cannot install the desired algorithms to censor the news. So uh, this very question was asked to a Houthi leader once, hmm. that why you don't do something to uh, build your image? He said that, um, uh, let's suppose I, I try to do something to build my image, who will uh, amplify that? Who will right. give that? trickle down effect hmm. who will give this snowball effect there is an echo chamber of voices and the entire western media is controlled by a single satellite and everything which is being said by anyone anyone on planet earth is going to yeah. the same filtration process so until and unless as china and russia are saying that we are going to have our own satellite system if russian state tv can be banned how we can amplify our voices but trust me even in europe not mm. not in like in the global south countries even in european countries there is lots of unrest 
people are looking at the reality what is being done mm -hmm. in the palestine this is an active genocide Absolutely. the second question was for uh, dr abbasi uh, the creation of pakistan based on ideology and your comparison with medina yeah <clears throat> i firmly stand with my opinion because uh, i have quoted qaidiyada mohammad ali jinnah mm -hmm. in his speech he, he said that we will follow the divine guidance which was revealed on prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam 14th century ago when he was asked what is the practical application of uh, ideology of pakistan he said prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life mm -hmm. spent time of 63 mm -hmm. years so role model is prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam qaidiyada map quoted and iqbal had expressed in his uh, prose and poetry that pakistan is reconciliation of religious thoughts in islam actually we want to experiment we want to show the practical representation of islamic culture and civilization to the world hmm. so this is the fault line and weakness of our rulers corrupt they are involved in corrupt practices ideology is, so is not problem is not with the creation right. or with the ideology yeah, the problem ideology is how is right. we are running the country now yeah exactly okay. that's why we are saying that this system should be replaced by khilafa model participatory model in which sayyidna umar farooq was surrounded by people and he was asked about his dress when sayyidna umar radhiyallahu ta'ala now was uh, asked to you know about battle mall and funding and each and everything hmm. everyone is accountable before the law in khilafa model so that's why takmeer e pakistan is going to you know aware the people about the uh, phenomena that these corrupt practices these status quo system is no more because they are looting the people they are they are uh, you know uh, taking the lives of the people hmm. on the stake of their health and other issues so basically we want to implement socio economic well being of the people that is mentioned in the article 38 which is suspended hmm. that hmm. is the true essence of khilafa model okay. so that's why we say that practical uh, representation and ideology must be practiced in the society according to quran and sunnah right let's take one question for mr ali hamza yeah. uh, my name is adan and i'm a student of international relations from namal i have a question if we talk about the past wars like Uh, world war 1 world war 2 and the cold war post cold war hmm. these all wars started because of a very small reason if we talk about the world war 1 it was started by the murder of the king and hmm. world war 2 started by the defeat of germany so these uh, wars these small issues led to a big econ economical change and a good uh, a very destructive change and lead to very uh, destructive wars hmm. uh, talking about the point the muslims of the palestinian are Uh, struggling themselves and and are facing very problems so in that case the other countries have to defend them and to help them hmm. but in case if the muslim try to help palestinian people is there any chance that the world will go for a world war 3 or okay. not right does this regional war has the potential to uh, become a world war ali hamza Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there are two parts of the question. The first part uh, was talk. He, the, the 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 student was talking about World War One, Two, uh, and Two. That there was a small reason, but we need to understand that there were never a small reason. There was a background to the war. Yes, it erupted because of some one small reason. Hmm. Uh, so now we also have a big background here for the Palestinian issue as well. Now the question uh, about that: if Muslim countries join together, can it lead to the World War Three? Now here we need to understand the global context. The global context is not just Muslim, non-Muslim thing. It, uh, first of all, we need to understand that. Um, the british uh, the times of british imperialism i mean if you go back 100 or 150 years back we realize that the the westerns or the british masters used the sectarianism uh, between the muslims as we call it a shia sunni war but it is not a shia sunni war arabs were used to uh, dismantle the ottoman empire so it was an arab and non arab thing that was manipulated by the western powers Now, um, one good thing uh, that 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 uh, that is interesting is that if you look at the uh, countries that do not recognize Israel, they are definitely Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran. Hmm. 
uh, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and, and many other countries. Uh, so, so it can unite uh, the Muslims. It could be a reason to unite the Muslims. But when, I, but when I talk about the global context, it's not just the unity of Muslims. When we talk about the Muslims, actually we are talking about the eastern side. And in the eastern side, there is China, there is Russia, and there are other African countries. Those, I mean, African countries, those have been economically deprived, and now they're struggling back. So it's an economic war. It's not a religious war. Mm. Western media has propagated such thing as a religious war, but it's an economic matter in totality. Right, I'm going to interrupt you on that note. I have to go for a short break and when we come back, we'll include more questions. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Sono Tonight with Saadi Afsa. Let's go back to the audience for more questions now. This is Nabil uh, from Namal IR department. Mm -hmm. My question is that, what role do proxy forces like Hezbollah, like uh, Hezbollah play uh, in regional forces and how do they impact uh, the balance of power? Okay, uh, we have discussed this already, but uh, would you like to elaborate further, uh, Ms. Chima? Yeah, no, Hezbollah is not um, like a proxy force. Hezbollah has a yeah. political uh, presentation in Lebanon, so it is now more than um, than, uh, than a proxy of something. So even Houthis are not proxy. and. Um, Shia Malaysia in Iraq, they are not proxies. They have their political um, ideology and they have their political presence. So far, uh, the, your next, uh, the next part of the question, I'm not clear about that. Do you ask that are they We discussed that already, how it's uh, shifting the balance of power. I think exactly, you, have, yeah. Yeah, you have answered so they, that they can, already. They can shift the balance hmm. of, of the power in the region, but they are not in haste, they are not acting hastily. Yeah. Uh, they want to be uh, remain politically viable in the region because Iran and all the other factions related to excess mm. of resistance, they, they have worked so hard to be become a political viable figure and rip out the label of being militants and um, terrorists and so yeah. on. So they want to be remain viable. They have, but they have regained the upper hand with this attack and would you call that it was just a teaser that we are capable of doing much more this than this? Was so this was this uh, this recent attack was the answer for Fawad Shuk murder and yeah. Hezbollah claimed that uh, we do not want to escalate the mm -hmm. war and we do not mix this attack with the yeah. resistance. Mm -hmm. The Palestinian resistance is, is there. That is yeah. a separate account and we yeah. have settled that account and Israel has acknowledged that that account has been settled. settled. We mm -hmm. killed somebody and they uh, deterred us and we are deterred. So mm -hmm. that was the account and Iran has to yet to settle the account of Haniya and, and that's, that's going on. So it is like a multi-dimensional um, mm. um, situation and issue and it is changing um, hourly and, and, and daily so you have to be very informed and very yeah. up to the toes to know what's going what's on. So this happening, recent right. attack was not uh, for the Palestinians. Okay, right. This was sir, for Fawad Shukri's murder. Yes, we'll, uh, we'll take one last question. Yes, please. Assalamu alaikum. This is Danish Mustafa from Rambal and my question is to Dr. Basi. As you mentioned that uh, is the, it's the Israel that is having uh, the corner, or, um, it's the Israel that is having the back or corner of the West and US. But if you just, re if we reflect upon the history, like uh, Israel is, uh, you know, at the back of these Western countries, Israel, it was on the back of, like, uh, you know, uh, in the history, uh, Israel, it was not, uh, you know, not given the chance to have an independent state, but rather it uh, made themselves uh, so powerful that they led to their independent state. They give, uh, you know, some, uh, you can say, uh, prizes or rewards for their countries like uh, mm. uh, British and others. Mm. So that's why they are having this state. But your point is totally opposite. Like we are listening it, we are always having it on social media, YouTube that it's the Israel that is always having the back of Western countries. So how you will say this? Is Israel uh, backing other Western countries or those yeah. countries backing Israel? That's Illegit his point. Illegitimate, uh, you know, state of the West. Yeah. This is very clear. Uh, when there was Ottoman Empire before 1914, before the World War I, hmm. there was peaceful environment in the region, in the whole Arabian Peninsula, because the Ottoman Empire was there. 
the Great Britain created a conspiracy against Ottoman Empire mm -hmm. when there was decline of Ottoman Empire. After that, there was an initiative of Zionism in that region. So they actually uh, gathered the different people from around the world and they put it in their, uh, you know, homeland of Palestinian people. So this is the act of illegitimacy of the West, even Great Britain. So uh, people are suffering, Palestinian or Muslim, the whole Muslim world is being suffering. So my point is that the West is behind that agenda. You should turn the 57 Islamic countries into different parts. Mm -hmm. They are relying on IMF, International Monetary Fund. So that's why they are not united. So they, are, they cannot uh, raise their voice powerfully on different forum. OIC is dead. Mm -hmm. UNO, uh, United Nations Organization, has become Union of yeah. Nuclear Officers. I, I, I've run nuclear. out of time, unfortunately. I have to wind up here. Thank you very much, Dr. Omar Zabasi, uh, Shazia Chima and Ali Hamza for joining us. And I thank you all as well for your questions. That's all for tonight. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night and Allah Hafiz.